um, and I teach and direct the museum at Pacific School of Religion called the Bade Museum. Um, and we're part of a consortium that's uh, co-sponsoring uh, this lecture searing, series, uh, Unsilencing the Archives. Um, and so I, it's, it's a real pleasure um, to um, start things off for our March lecture. Uh, and first I'd like to hand over the floor um, to our associate curator, Brooke Norton, who will read our, our land and decolonization statement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Berkeley, California is on the territory of the Huchiun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone. We respect the land and the people who have stewarded it throughout many generations, and we honor their elders, both past and present. We are living in a moment that warrants deep reflection on our past, wherein even our most venerated figures deserve reasonable scrutiny. During his time directing the archaeological excavations at Tel Nazba, W.F. Bade participated in harmful stereotyping of Palestinian Arabs that was common among white Americans and Europeans during conducting field work in British Mandate Palestine. Some of these attitudes appear in print in his popular 1934 book, A Manual of Excavation in the, in the, in the Near East. Museums are also scrutinizing their collections, including evaluating the legal status and the ethics with which they were acquired. As stewards of the legacy of the Bade Museum and its holdings, it is our responsibility to faith faithfully evaluate the process by which the collections were acquired within the context of our contemporary moment. One approach is to ask new questions of the archival materials in order to examine critically the manner and impact of archaeological work on Indigenous communities and to investigate the colonial conditions in which it played a part. The Bade Museum recognizes that its location and collection are part of ongoing and painful colonial legacies that contributed to historical inequalities. These leg legacies have directly and indirectly impacted populations locally and abroad in Palestine where the excavations were conducted under the authority of the British Mandate Government of Palestine. In an effort to bring light to these issues, to serve a broader public audience online, and to conduct the local, connect to the local community that it serves, the museum is taking action to become a more inclusive, welcoming, and equitable institution that practices the philosophy of radical inclusion adopted by its parent institution, Pacific School of Religion. One of these steps is the creation of open access web exhibitions and public programming like this lecture series, which highlight decolonizing themes. We invite you to participate in these programs so that together we can listen, learn, and work to, towards creating a more inclusive museum community. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Brooke. Um, and to pass the uh, baton to uh, Ava Clark for the PEF. So <clears throat> my name is Ava Clark, and I'm from the PEF. And um, uh, the PEF fully endorses the Bade Museum statement on decolonization and supports their efforts in this regard. As a funding organization, we were very pleased to support the Bade Museum's project to create an online exhibition to highlight the lives and work of the Arab workforce at, at the Tel El uh, Nazbe exhibitions uh, excavations. And these online and these online lectures exploring the contribution of the local population to the archaeology of Palestine. As another Western colonial era organization, our own history um, shares many of the same characteristics which have just been described. And we are keen to play our part in this process, both as co-hosts of these lectures and with our own initiatives. And um, with that, it gives me great pleasure to actually introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. John Jack Green, uh, Miami University um, Art Museum. Um, whose topic is Archaeology, Community, and Public Health at Palestine, Insights from the Olga Tafnal Archive. Um, Dr. Green is the Jeffrey Horrell and Rodney Rose Director and the Chief Curator of the Miami University Art Museum from 2021 to the present. Um, he received his MA and PhD in Archaeology from University College London in 2001 and 2006. He has held curatorial and administrative positions at um, museums at the University of Oxford, University of Chicago, and the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, he most recently worked on cultural heritage initiatives, research, and archival projects at the American Center of Research, Amman, Jordan, from 2017 to 21, um, including the Temple of the Winged Lions Cultural uh, Resource Management Initiative in Petra. 
Um, he's also engaged in the Tel El Sedia uh, Cemetery in Jordan publication project with the British Museum. His co-edited open access book with Ross Henry, Olga Tufnell's Perfect Journey, Letters and Photographs of an Archaeologist in the Levant and Mediterranean from UCL Press is based largely on archives housed at the Palestine Exploration Fund in London. And so over to you. Great. Thank you so much for the wonderful introductions. I assume you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. Can you see that okay? Great, thank you. Um, I also wanted to, before I begin, uh, I wanted to give an acknowledgement, um, a land acknowledgement from where I'm, I'm seated and where I'm uh, speaking to you from. So I'm at the Miami University here in Oxford and we at the museum, at the art museum here, we respectfully acknowledge the uh, Shawnee and Miami people who along with other indigenous groups were the first stewards of the land that this university, Miami University, and this museum uh, now occupies. Um, I also want to thank uh, all of the people who've made this possible today, this, this event and this whole series on silencing the archives. It's really an excellent opportunity to delve into archival research and to share um, some things that perhaps are not usually covered or not usually explored in say archaeological reports but are extremely important for understanding the wider context. I want to thank Aaron and uh, Felicity, uh, Aaron Brody, the Bardet Museum, uh, Felicity Cobbing of course at the Palestine Exploration Fund who I'm, I know can't join us uh, sadly today. Um, but at the same time um, I want to say uh, thank you to my co-author and editor of the book um, that this uh, research was is can be found in, and that's uh, Ros Henry, uh, who's in the UK. And I'm uh, hoping that Ros can uh, is listening in today and watching us. Uh, I hope she is. Uh, so hi, Ros, and thank you so much for all your work and the help with this project um, in, in co-editing, co-introducing, and co-authoring uh, the book. Um, and uh, there are so many other people to thank. And in this uh, pro in this presentation, you'll see images from various archives that I'll be mentioning in a moment. Of course, the Palestine Exploration Fund itself, which houses the Olga Tufnell archive. So let's just move on. So um, I'll be speaking today about Olga Tufnell's role um, as an archeologist, British archeologist, uh, working in Palestine in the twenties and thirties. Um, but also about this sort of less known aspect of her humanitarian work, particularly with local communities and uh, in terms of health and public health. So that's one of the areas I'll be focusing on in particular. But first of all, who was Olga Tufnell? Why is she important? And um, perhaps why has she been overlooked? And I hope not overlooked too much longer. So first of all, Olga Tufnell is probably best known uh, for her publication work um, in preparation of the volumes for the Tel Aviv or uh, Lakish Lakish expedition. So this was a, a major archaeological project um, that was sponsored by uh, the um, Henry Welcome and um, also uh, Marston, who was a major sponsor as well. And it was a it was a considerable exp expedition with a major publication project, and Olga really saw through a lot of that publication, and so you can see the results of that work in those volumes I can, I'm showing here: the Fossey Temple, Iron Age, and Bronze Age volumes, for example. Uh, Olga Tufnell came from um, uh, a pretty wealthy, uh, privileged background, although she was not someone who uh, really necessarily had a lot of actual money in her life, but she did. Uh, she she did come from this particular background, and she. Um, you can see her family home here. She's in this photograph in the center at the age of three in one of the motor cars, and that's the that sort of family home there. Um, and you can see as a as a young woman, she wasn't entirely sure where her career would take her, and it wasn't really until um, she had become engaged with the Petries um, as a young woman that she became involved in archeology span through her experience 
uh, there that led her to this really interesting, diverse career in archaeology towards becoming a really a professional archaeologist. She was um, certainly someone who uh, you could describe went from being, say, an amateur to a professional. She didn't have any formal academic qualifications, though, um, and that was something that you see quite a bit in those early years of archaeology. Um, the archives that I'll be talking about, most of them come from the Palestine Exploration Fund itself, and they're the Olga Tufnell Archive, and this consists largely of letters um, and also some photographs um, that were donated uh, to the P Palestine Exploration Fund uh, through he Heather Bell, who was the librarian at the Institute of Archaeology. And um, they're a really important archive. I'll be showing some examples of those in a moment. Uh, but also there are other archives here, the Welcome Marston Archaeological Research Expedition Archive, uh, which is at the British Museum, um, UCL, the Petrie Museum, so University College London, and also the Institute of Archaeology. There are also some archives I'll be briefly mentioning from the Wellcome Trust and the Wellcome Trust uh, Collection, the Egypt Exploration Society, as well as the Starkey Family Archive, James Starkey being the director of that uh, Teled de Ware expedition. And of course, I want to thank all of those people who have helped to get access to collections and archives to make this research possible. So this is just a couple of examples of some of the letters um, that are within the Olga Tufnell archive at the, at the PEF. And so we've got handwritten letters as well as typed out letters. Um, and this particular book project, which is published through UCL Press and is open access, the link is there, so you can access this for free. Uh, it's a great resource. It's easy to search and find things just through a word search, for example, uh, when you download the PDF. Um, so it's a great resource for exploring history, archaeology, ar history of archaeology, and so many different aspects, relationships with um, the local community, the workers, um, some details of archaeology, tourism and travel. There's just so many aspects here. Um, so you'll see here some just examples of how this work is kind of important and interesting from the point of view of providing insights into the labor forces who worked on uh, these archaeological projects uh, in the early 20th century in Mandate era Palestine. Um, some work has been done, of course, on some workers and, and some of the people who could be described as hidden hands uh, or the invisible labor force. Uh, a couple of books I want to raise here, the Hidden Hands by Stephen Quirk, which focuses on the Kufti workers um, who worked with Petrie in Egypt. Um, we can extend that relationship with the Kuftis to his work in Palestine, which has not necessarily been um, presented so much uh, in, in terms of scholarly research, but is beginning to be. And actually, I just want to point out some inter an interesting article just published in the Palestine Exploration Quarterly by Eric Klein about the Kufti workers at Megiddo. So Kufti describes the workers from uh, Kuft in Egypt, and they came with Petrie and other uh, were workers, specialized um, workers who came to work on archaeological projects uh, in Palestine, also in Syria, uh, in, in this period of time. Uh, here we see a, couple, a few picture, a, couple, a picture of uh, some of the uh, workers, the Kuftis, who came to Tel El Farah South uh, with the Petrie expedition there and who Olga um, had um, uh, worked with as well. Another recent book is those, Why Those Who Shovel Are Silent. History of Local Archaeological Knowledge and Labour by Alison Mickle, which puts all of this into a wider context. Why is it that we don't know too much about these workers and what, what's their role in, in, in projects? We should be doing more to highlight their names, their identities, and their contributions to these archaeological discoveries. They're very important. Here's an image from the Olga Tufnell archive showing a um, group of workers who were working really very closely with Olga Tufnell at the site of Teled de Weir. Um, this is from the 1930s, although it's completely, it's not dated particularly, but we have the names of these people written in her photographic album, which we're now able to present and publish in here. So this kind of thing of finding out who these people are, 
um, it adds more to the story. These discoveries weren't just being made by Western um, archaeologists and experts. These discoveries were being shared with the local communities and there's a certain level of pride and importance to the history there that we need to acknowledge. One of the really interesting things, um, and a lot of this actually is published in various places, but and also now in the new book, um, is the sort of colonial attitudes of the time and also how they changed over time as well. I'm including a quote here, and this le leads into the humanitarian aspect of the talk. Um, and that is Olga's own words, Olga Tofnell's own words when she visited the site uh, of Tel Adawir, ancient uh, Lakish or Lakish, in 1983, um, towards the end of her life. You see a photograph of her here during that visit. She gave a lecture. Uh, this was the expedition then run by uh, David Usishkin, Tel Aviv University, and it was uh, in, in modern day Israel today. Uh, Olga writes, um, there was one good thing, perhaps, this is reminiscing about the time. Um, there was one good thing about um, that system and employing the locals who were then in very poor way and had a very tiny living standard. It was lovely to see during the time that they were working for us, um, uh, how the small skinny boys and the pale girls who worked as our basket children grew and flourished and their faces filled out. That was something I feel was a real contribution to this part of the world. Um, it's worth noting here that this was uh, in, in the previous era in the 30s, local people in these reports were often referred to as natives. And so we see here really employing the locals as a kind of substitute to that. Um, but that idea of a kind of um, that these archaeological projects were doing good, they were benevolent, they provided resources, provided employment uh, to the local population, whether they were the, uh, the Bedouin population uh, who came to work more seasonally and moved through that area, or the local uh, Fellahin, the, the, the settled villagers there who also worked on these projects. But this idea that um, there was this uh, positive aspect in terms of employment that would lead to improved living conditions and generally raise the standards for those people. That was a very kind of, it's a very kind of colonialist sort of viewpoint, but also one that um, you could argue is sort of paternalist in viewpoint or maternalist in this case with Olga Tofnell herself. Uh, but that idea that people were there and they were helping um, these local people to have a better life. So where does that kind of uh, idea come from, that idea of um, archaeological projects and getting involved with humanitarian um, issues and, and concerns? Well, Olga's role as a Petrie's pup, Petrie pup, so that means she was one of the um, uh, people who kind of came under the wing of Flinders Petrie, you can see in this image on the, on the left, um, and became um, sort of one of his proponents, as, as it were, um, on the projects that they worked together on, but also the role of Hilda Petrie, uh, Flinders Petrie's wife, who was an important archeologist, Egypt, Egyptologist in her own right, but also she was a sponsor of medical charities in the First World War. Um, she was, um, you can read about this in Debbie Chalice's uh, fairly recent blog, talking about her support of uh, Dr. Elsie Inglis and the Scot Scottish Women's Hospital um, and generally nursing in that First World War period. Um, and if it wasn't for Hilda Petrie, Olga would not have got into archaeology because Hilda Petrie was a good friend of Olga Tufnell's mother, Blanche Tufnell, and that's probably how they got introduced to each other too. They were... Um, Blanche was also, uh, and Olga herself, were great supporters of um, Czechoslovakia and, and also Eastern Europe in terms of uh, the beginnings of those uh, countries and, and helping out in various ways. So they were kind of um, activists and, and um, charitable, doing good things, working for charities and also with suffragist uh, movements as well. So there's that wider context there. Also working with uh, Petrie, um, the Petries in um, the Gaza region with uh, Tel El Ajul uh, is a really good example. And Rachel Sparks has written uh, uh, about this in her pu uh, publication, Publicizing Petrie. 
about financing field work. Um, the digging of these canals, uh, which was actually paid for through the expedition, but through subscription. So um, the mandate government at that time had um, been all set to start digging canals and clearing that region of malaria. So digging the canals so the winter rains can flush through and get rid of the malarial mosquitoes. Um, but that wasn't forthcoming. So Petrie took it on, on himself to make sure that this land was um, good for the archaeologists, but also the local population. And actually make a point of this in that publicity. Hospitals a necessity, archaeology a hobby. What they're arguing here is that you actually are contributing to public health uh, improvements by supporting this archaeological dig so we can get rid of the malaria. So here's a really good example of that intersection. Malaria was a real concern for the archaeologists. So this photograph here showing the team members from um, uh, going back to uh, Jewel and Tel Aviv, uh, sorry, uh, Tel Aviv and um, Tel Aviv South. You see here uh, James Starkey, uh, who's here in the very smart suit, second from right in the in the left photograph, and also Harding on the right, who's dressed in sort of uh, Arab uh, gear. Um, both of them really suffered from malaria, and that, that's clear in the letters from Olga, Olga Tufnell, that they were uh, suffering from malaria, but it was also a widespread issue. So uh, treatment for malaria with quinine, but also getting rid of the source of, of the malaria itself was a very high concern. Um, during the work at Tel El Farah South, this was uh, really 1928, 1929, um, there is mention uh, Olga Tufnell mentions for the first time in her uh, in an interview later in her life, and it's not mentioned in the letters, that she started a clinic at the site treating the workers for malaria using quinine. And although we don't have, I don't have any other sources that show that, there's no reason to suggest that might not have been the case, um, but uh, we don't have any other data to suggest that. So I'm not going to dwell on that, but it does show that the beginnings of that really seem to be at Tel Afar South with Olga taking a role in that uh, treatment of people with malaria. And it wasn't really until um, the work at Tel El Ajul, particularly in 1930 to early 32, uh, where we've got uh, more intensive work with the clinics and the humanitarian aspect um, and Olga taking a lead role in that. So in addition, you've got the major discoveries like the equid burials and the Bronze Age city that, that's being discovered. Um, but also there's this aspect of the humanitarianism. And this is really interesting because there was a retired biology professor by the name of Dr. Sperrin Johnson, who was actually uh, based in New Zealand at that time, but originally had come, um, I think was uh, also connected with the university uh, in, um, in Ireland. And he um, was actually brought in by Flinders Petrie to come in and measure skulls. So basically this is the eugenics theory and the idea of you can um, find out races of people um, from their skulls and then make determinations about civilization and progress. Um, of course, it's widely discredited of course now, but um, that's what he was there to do. But in the meantime, he also helped uh, they ran a clinic together, uh, Tufnell and Sperrin Johnson, uh, during the 31 to 32 season. And Olga Tufnell writes in her letter that she reports seeing over 100 patients a week. So this would have been various things that they were treating, but I think malaria being a key one, uh, but not only that aspect. So it gives you a sense of the scale here. But it wasn't really until Tel Aviv and that expedition to um, also known as ancient uh, Lakish or Lakish. Um, in 1932 uh, to 1938. Uh, so this was a really much big, much larger scale expedition um, with more resources and sponsorship. You can see in this photograph, Olga is in the background and in a way she often spends a lot of time in the background in photographs. So her voice is kind of hidden in a lot of these things, but actually through the letters, she's able to kind of express what she's, she's writing to her mother, she's telling her about what's going on. Um, so we get a sense of, of her activities, but otherwise we really wouldn't know much about her, her key role here. 
they were really busy all the time at all these expeditions, working all hours, getting up at dawn, going out to dig, coming back, eating, then getting into sort of pottery uh, registration. And in addition to that, doing running a clinic. So this is where we start talking about the uh, so-called eye hospital. And this has been written about before in, in previous articles, but um, here we're able to flesh it out a little bit more. So the name of this clinic, it's got various names. Sometimes it's referred to as the clinic. Sometimes the Arabic name, the Ayada. Um, and sometimes the um, uh, dispensary is another term. And sometimes Olga's Eye Hospital. So that really refers to the importance of eye diseases at this time, and particularly the treatment of trachoma and conjunctivitis. And I'm not going to show you pictures of what that involves, but basically it's a kind of infection um, that can lead to blindness if it's not treated. It's, it causes swellings under the eyes, eyelids, causes the eyelashes to grow in on themselves. Then the, you have the issue of those eye, eyelashes and um, causing scratches to the cornea. And that leads eventually to blindness if it's untreated. It can be easily treated. It's one, and at this time in Palestine, blindness and eye diseases were one of the highest, uh, most important uh, uh, goals to be tackled in terms of public health, um, particularly in rural areas, but all over Palestine. And, and so this was a big focus for some of the medical charities and organizations and the, and the mandate um, health um, areas too to try to tackle. But of course, they couldn't tackle all these areas, particularly rather remote um, rural areas. And this is where the eye clinic comes in or the eye hospital is that it filled a gap. Um, and that really provided resources for both um, Bedouin communities who are coming from far, far afield, including as far away as uh, Beersheba in, in um, 40 kilometers away, people walking that distance to get treatment. Uh, but also within the local community, um, the people living um, and working uh, at the site, uh, near the site. So this was a really important resource. And you can see some of the people involved. Uh, he's got, she's got children who are helping her um, measuring liquids um, and, and presumably helping her to dispense the, uh, the treatment to. We don't know the names of those individuals, but I wanted to say that they're important. They should be acknowledged. Uh, as they helped out a lot. Um, interestingly, there's a connection here, although not necessarily a direct connection, but I think it's interesting and worth pointing out that Sir Henry Welcome, who was the co-founder of the pharmaceutical company, uh, Burroughs Welcome and Company uh, um, in 1880, um, was one of the main sponsors of the expedition, the Welcome Archaeological Research Expedition to the Near East. And they did provide resources toward medical expenses, so they were aware of this. And I think that was a sort of tie in in terms of the idea of providing medical treatment, um, although it wasn't necessarily the main mission uh, of the expedition. It was uh, certainly something seen that, that, that could be a, um, of benefit to the local community as well. But interestingly, this quote in one of the reports, and um, they're using obviously language that was in use at the time, and I wouldn't uh, suggest this language is applicable today, but they're saying that the, the reputation of the expedition stands in the native mind for, uh, for health as well as for regular employment. So this idea that this is not just about employing local people, but it's also about providing health uh, and resources towards health. And that was seen as, again, this idea of sort of benevolence and, and the idea is in a way it ties in very well with the idea of colonial medicine. And we'll talk a bit about that a bit later on. So what is this dispensary exactly and what did it contain? Well, it really seemed that there was very, it was, it was pretty basic. Um, as you can see in this photograph, you can see all the med medical items up on the top shelf, sort of far out of reach. Um, but it includes things like Epsom salts and cod liver oil and things like that. But other kinds of um, treatments for eye diseases are also mentioned in the letters. And we also see in Olga Tufnell's room, if you look at her bookcase, she's got ophthalmic science and practice as part of her bedtime reading. Um, so that's another aspect there. Um, in terms of she was really involved and wanted to be 
get learn gain more knowledge but um she didn't have expertise or training she had to go and find that so um so she did so um she took a course uh with uh dr uh, strathan um dr john strathan of the order of saint john in jerusalem in the hospital there um and she mentions in one letter that she spent five days or so um so far and she's seen lots of different cases of diseases and learned how to treat the most common uh diseases more scientifically than she previously knew so this was in, in december 32 um, she's really starting the season at Tel Aviv, but really serious about making this uh, an important part of the project. You can see uh, St John's Hospital, St John Eye Hospital, um, which is in the left side of this this colour photograph here, this postcard, um, and it's still going today, uh, but it's known as St John Eye Hospital Group. Uh, so it's still an active uh, charity today um, in. Um, the Palestinian territories. Uh, let's move into the next slide. Okay. And here we see some other interesting uh, letters. She writes actually to Dr. John Strathern. Um, and this includes mention of the fact that she is seeing, she's consulting with him, um, getting corrections, getting notes, uh, seeing between 30 and 40 people a day, which is a lot of people. Not sure if that's an over exaggeration or if it's it's really accurate. And was it every day? We don't really know. But a large proportion of them are eye cases. Um, she also writes that someone saw her um, in in the hospital in a white coat. So assume that she had this sort of additional medical exper experience or qualification that she doesn't necessarily have. But she does impress on them the importance of going up to the eye hospital and offering them notes to them when they do go. So um, she notes the bad cases in the village with heavy discharge, particularly with the children. And then really interesting, she talks about trachoma in children um, and the types of treatment, asking about the very young children, ages between two and seven years old, and the kinds of treatment. Um, so she's consulting on this, what kind of uh, medicine, boracic um, uh, or protagal, which is safe, we have no idea if these treatments were effective. We don't have any reports that um, I'm aware of that indicate that, but um, we know that a large number of people would have been treated. Another really interesting aspect here is the location of the clinic. So in this red square here, you can see on the right-hand side of the square was where Olga's room was on the dig, but also to the left, in on, just in the corner there, is the clinic, but also all the dig project people are living here around it. Starkey is, is on the left side. We've got Harding as well, and various other people. So this is really the living area. It's not clear exactly whether this was the location of the clinic for the entire duration, um, but it's, this is based on the memory of John Starkey, who was the son of James Starkey, who's still living and provided his childhood memory of where things were. And they kind of match up with the photographs as well. So there's no reason to doubt that, but um, he, the people would have come into the inner courtyard from outside and um, come into this space. We imagine there might have been lines of people here. And this is just a picture just showing a party that took place at the in the courtyard. Um, but it shows um, the workers and local people who were there in there. And this was completely different to, say, the Petrie model, uh, where they had the inner courtyard and the Petrie expeditions, but they wouldn't, wouldn't really let local people into that space. Um, from outside. So we show, see a sort of opening up uh, to the community here um, and really providing that kind of access. It was in a way also a kind of way to show that they really did care and they wanted to have that degree of openness. Um, I believe so at least in terms of the visibility of that, but there's no photographs, which is really interesting. And that only makes me assume, unless there are other photographs that are out there in the archives I haven't found, um, must be that there was a deliberate reason why photographs were not being taken. Even the earlier photograph showing Olga administering eye drops into the man seated, it's taken unawares. You can tell that she was not posing for that photograph. So I think that gives you a clue as to the respect that there was, there was for the local people. 
There's another aspect of health that's interesting. Um, again, Olga didn't have any formal medical training, but she often took on the role uh, as being a, a kind of specialist. She had access to medical supplies, but also some rudimentary knowledge. And so she kind of played a sort of nursing role in a way. And of course, people in the village would come to her for, um, this is the village of Kobeba, by the way, um, come to her for help, particularly also with maternity needs. So she writes in October 1933 that she went across the village to see the famous twins uh, born a few weeks ago. And um, she says that the, this time last year, I was attending the uh, first child of Hamid and his wife, trying despite myself to save it from an inevitable grave. And then saying that the parents have certainly not wasted much time as the twins are already lust, strong and lusty individuals. Um, so we, we see how she is playing a role with um, these, uh, with, with women and families and particularly to do a childbirth and also getting called out for an emergency midwifery call um, because someone had been labor, in labor for 15 hours, but she just shows up and then the baby is born. So she's kind of got this sort of talismanic, talismanic quality here that enables um, things to move in positive directions as well. So that's one insight. Um, sort of getting close to wrapping up now, but I just wanted to give a bit of a sense of the wider context of colonial medicine in Mandate Era Palestine. It's an emerging topic and it's a very hot topic, um, of course, with um, public health and humanitarianism. But there are a few interesting articles here. Um, for example, Bedouin Health Services Mandated Palestine by Abu Rabia, which provides us with the context of both, um, you could argue sort of resistance to um, colonial medicine or new medicine, as well as acceptance of it and access to it, differential access. Um, that's a really interesting article also relates to the the regions that we're talking about for Tel Far South um, and uh, to some extent Tel Dawir as well. Um, uh, Bormand, Philip Bormand's work on epidemiology in the city um, is something that is interesting and worth a look at from Ordinary Jerusalem. And I was also point out Julia Schatz's work on governing Jerusalem's children, revealing invisible inhabitants, looking at the American Colony Aid Association. Excuse me, and I think that that's kind of interesting from the point of view of whether this kind of um, humanitarianism, is it in concert with the state, in service of the state, um, or are these sort of NGOs and organizations, these early NGOs or charities, they are serving an important role, but in a way the mandate authorities don't have the resources to cover all these areas, so they allow these charities and organizations to do the work that they would normally be doing. But interestingly, the impact that has is you end up with a kind of divided um, healthcare system because you have um, healthcare services sometimes often being uh, divided up by on religious or ethnic lines, or you know, for example, the initiation of Jewish, Jewish charities or um, charities that are focused on um, uh, um, Arab populations, so that you end up actually creating potentially a less integrated intercommunal, a non, non communal health system. So that's one sort of um, unintended or perhaps intended consequence. Um, but I think others here are more expert in, in judging that, and, and, and you can read about their work here. But just in summary, um, I just want to say that I think that Olga, I was thinking about who was an influence here on her to set up the clinics? Was it Sparrow Johnson? Was it Hilda Petrie a force here in leading her towards this, this clinic? Um, was it Welcome himself? Was it this idea that Welcome, the Welcome uh, organization, the company was helping out as well? I think perhaps all of those things, but I think that Olga herself uh, deserves credit as the driving force for this. Um, she used the available resources, she had influence from others, but this was for mutual benefit to the archeological projects and the local communities. And she certainly did not boast about it. She was very modest. And that's the reason why we don't know much about this, except for now we're beginning to tease this out from the archives. Um, 
What's interesting is this uh, informal public health role of archaeological projects. What role does that play in the study of colonial medicine? I believe that there are other projects that also did this, but we just don't know about them uh, very much. And I'd be really interested in hearing uh, about those, if anyone knows of any other archaeological projects that have that uh, kind of role, whether informally or formally, in filling a gap in terms of medical treatment. And then going back to that whole topic of the role of these kinds of organizations, formal, informal, in filling the gap, humanitarian governance, um, that's kind of, um, in a way, one of the terms that Schatz uses, and it relates to the provision of social welfare in concert with the state. So not necessarily directly from the state, but in concert with. And I wonder if this could be thought of in that term, in those terms, um, because, or is it outside of that realm? So that's an open question there. But I do think that um, it will be interesting to explore that whole issue, as I mentioned, about other archaeological projects. So interesting to hear your thoughts on that. And then lastly, just to sort of bring things to today, because we talked about the employment aspect and the benevolence of kind of archaeological projects coming in and providing work and, and pay and, and employment to local workforces to and that's actually a kind of ongoing theme. And I think we talk about development and the role of international development today in terms of archaeological field work and cultural heritage preservation. This is very much also from my own experience working in Jordan um, and seeing the work and then getting being involved in projects like the Temple of the Winged Lions uh, CRM initiative is that international development plays a key role in funding initiatives focused on things like tourism development but ultimately there's also projects that help to build jobs and experience and know-how um, and that helps um, local communities uh, helps local communities to understand the importance of heritage but also provides wages and also job opportunities in the future and so that employment aspect i think is something that kind of runs through and perhaps we should be thinking of this as a kind of continuum of kind of this idea of humanitarianism connecting into archaeology um, in terms of a colonial as well as a post-colonial setting. So I just want to throw that out there for discussion and debate. Um, and I want to thank all of the people who've made the research possible on this, this book, which um, you can't see, but here it is. Um, and uh, all of the people who made this archival research possible. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your fascinating talk. Um, the amount of work it must have taken to do a full scale excavation and run a public health uh, program is incredible. Um, you, you mentioned that the, the Petries and, and Olga Tufnel were not necessarily unique in their, their focus on public health through archeology. span Do you think it's possible to see a larger trend with other archaeologists at the time doing the same? Well, that's my question. I, I would like to put that out there if people know of examples. I'm, I'm only guessing because obviously there would be, um, most projects would have someone who is um, involved in dispensing medicine or in charge of medical supplies. Um, they might have a nurse or a, or a doctor on, on the team or someone with some rudimentary training or access to a local doctor. Um, if they're in remote locations, they're, they're obviously going to have um, uh, medical supplies and people locally who don't have access to those are wanting to get access to them as well. And it stands to reason that you would want to um, provide those resources to the workers as well for their safety. Be for their well-being um, and uh, to help them, especially with their injuries um, or illnesses. Um, so I think that it must have been fairly common, but it was being not necessarily recorded in a way that would be uh, visible to us. It might be in the archives, and that's what that's what the question. I, I think that um, this may have been more common. And I was thinking about Jebel Moya in uh, Sudan, which was one of the projects that welcome self was involved with as a sponsor um, and um, that particular project um, there were kind of accusations in the earlier stages of mistreatment of workers and then there was a big 
goal towards increasing the number of workers and providing uh, clear, visible um, examples of good treatment of the workers. And that was important to the archaeologists at that time too. So I think it was common, just we don't know so much about it, but happy to hear any thoughts or feedback on that. Um, so we have a, a question sort of on the, the balance of, of archaeology and um, public health. Um, someone would like you to, if wonders if you could speculate a bit about sort of how much time Tufnell spent excavating um, versus working in the, the clinics in a typical season. Yeah, um, you know, that's, that's a bit of a mystery. I have to be honest. I don't know. I, I'm only, I can only assume that they would have had set hours or days where the clinic would have been open, uh, especially if you've got people coming from miles around. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think it was something you could just drop in, but of course in an emergency, uh, I think that that was always possible. In terms of the time, um, I know that they, they worked in the field pretty much uh, certainly for six to eight hours a day, I would say, I'm not sure exactly, but they started very early in the mornings. Um, and they would be working on fines and so forth. So I imagine it would have been an afternoon activity, but no idea if there was a specific day or so forth. But she mentions so many people a day, which implies that it was multiple days in a week that this was going on. But I'd say I don't have that information. Uh, do you know if the, the so they're working in the, the field and, and, and also working in the clinic, do you know if the project was the public health project was run seasonally. Um, you know, if so, did the, the worker, what did the workers do in the interim between field seasons um, for either employment or, or medical treatment? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and so Olga Tofner was there for pretty much half the year. Um, they would arrive typically in any time between October, excuse me, and December, to start the season it obviously depended on the when ramadan was as well um, and then they would work through often to uh april or may um and so in the summer in the um summertime to early fall they would not have been there now there were guards and there were people there i don't know if anyone have, would have had access to the medical supplies but it's a really good question my feeling is it may not have been full access. Obviously, wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to access Olga Tufnell's own knowledge, but she had those assistants as well. So I'm not sure if they played a role. Is there any, um, any indication in the archives, um, some of her assistants, uh, were they paid fair living wages for their sort of labor in the, in the program? Um, do you know if they often rehired the same uh, assistants uh, season after season? Yeah, and, I mean, we don't know about the, the assistants who helped out with the um, clinic, but I imagine they would have been paid a little bit towards that. They were probably would have already been existing workers, uh, probably working on the baskets, so they didn't employ children um, and women as well as men. And um, they, I think that it's something, it, it's, it's probably about half of what one of the adults would have been paid. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the specific figure to hand, but they, I'm assuming they would have been paid, but I don't have any data on that for the for the clinic itself. But the, certainly for the baskets, working in the field, um, clearing baskets and sieving, they would have been paid. Uh, so we have another question sort of about the logistics and you may have answered this already. Um, did the, was it the, the archeologists themselves who were running the clinic or did they bring in other team members um, during the excavation, the field season who were there to focus solely on the, the clinic? It really just seems to be Olga Tufnell herself. That's my impression. And her assistants who were the, the probably the children who are, mentioned in in it was shown in the photographs um I, I do not know of mention apart from in tell the jewel when she is running the clinic with dr sperrin johnson i don't have any other um information about anyone who substituted for her or ran the clinic in her absence or with her it may have been that, that 
she had help, but I don't have any record of that. And so you mentioned in terms of sponsorship, the, um, the wellness company provided some sort of support, but do you know to what extent um, government support was available for these types of projects or for um, Olga's project in, um, specifically? Uh, as far as I know, there was, there was no government support uh, in my view. I think that uh, it's possible they may have had some uh, of the medical supplies could have come via the eye hospital maybe. I do know that uh, the expedition sent a donation to the eye hospital for five pounds in one season because that's a receipt in one of Olga's letters and in one of Olga's letters. That might have been just simply in kind for in kind support perhaps for the training or just as a recognition of their of their assistance. Um, I think that the reason why there wasn't any there wasn't this level of medical support. Um, in a way, that was the reason for it being there, the clinic, is that it provided, it filled a gap. And um, in terms of the resources, there are there are some accounts that are in the Wellcome uh, Trust uh, collection that include medical expenses. Uh, I haven't seen anything itemized yet, but we're talking about anything between 24 and 34 pounds in a season. Um, which is quite a bit if you think about it, but that could include medical expenses for the team members, like having to go to hospital. So it's not clear to me yet how much of that was for the specific supplies, but I, I'm pretty sure that it was done voluntary basis on a shoestring with very limited resources and with fairly inexpensive uh, medical supplies. Um, so I, I feel it was done um, in 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 an inexpensive way, but on a slightly larger scale, as we saw in terms of the number of people who could be treated. Yeah, so you mentioned that at one point they were seeing about 30 to 40 people per day. Um, do you know what, or is it possible to know, was the you know knowledge of the clinic spread by word of mouth? Um, do we know, do we have any idea sort of how large the clinic grew or the the number of patients throughout its duration um you know specifically for scale like how many people lived in the the local village that's a really good question i think for the local village i think you've got about 600 households or so i believe in kobeba it's hard i have to go back and and check that um uh, it's it's a it's a, it's a larger village. It's, it's a medium sort of size village, I think. But then the I think that many of the people coming also uh, Bedouin uh, population who are working there that come perhaps from other places to settle there for the work, and that that could be one of the reasons why word of mouth spread quite a bit um, among particularly the Bedouin communities, um, who some of whom are coming from. The Gaza region because they were working and and they were working there with the projects before and a jewel and in uh, in Tel Afar South as well and they they often came for the additional work at Tel Adawir as well later on so I think that through those networks there must have been a lot of word of mouth I don't think there was any need to advertise this um, in other ways but um, yeah I think word of mouth is probably the main the main thing. Um, so someone's noted uh, there's this interesting tension between sort of a colonial colonialist presence of Western archaeologists and this actual um, help that's given to locals that the, the clinic provided. Um, could you give your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the, the tension, I guess, that existed, I guess that um, I think that we when we look at read some of the uh, articles um, that have been written about these public health issues in the mandate period, particularly Abu Rabia, there are, uh, and some other articles as well. There's there is a tension that exists between the emergence of like globalized medicine and new medicine alongside traditional medicine. You know, you got to think about this from the point of view of if there are traditional methods, and then you're bringing in something that is going to sort of supersede that tradition. And I know that there is an ongoing research that's being done on that um, tension between 
those traditions um, and uh, the new medicines coming in. In Hebron, for example, I know that there were smallpox vaccinations that were being um, proposed and actually instituted. And then there was resistance to that as well and, and fear and, and also um, concern about what that might bring for the, the local populations. And um, you talk about anti-vaccination sort of ideas. That was also something that was happening then too. Um, that there wasn't any vaccination as far as I know going on through this clinic uh, so it was fairly benign in terms of the eye treatments and perhaps quinine and things that were not too heavy duty uh, in terms of treatments um, so I think that it was generally seen as a benevolent thing um, I think later on when we have uh, something I didn't mention is the uh, murder of um, James Starkey in 1938 the director of the expedition, he was murdered um, by, in the term, terms of the time, they're called brigands, but they were basically sort of involved with the, um, in the Arab revolt. And that was um, something that was really shocking at the time, of course, and it led to the end of the expedition. There's been some discussion and debate about uh, whether that was a deliberate thing. They were targeted uh, because of some land dispute uh, to do with the the uh, Dewey location, and this was a revenge killing, effectively, or if it was just simply a case of someone being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, I, I think that the argument to say that the local people were really found an overall benef benefit with this medical clinic is something that's in favour of this being that people when these people the people in the dig were friends of the local people and they they this was not just a show this was a real a real feeling of of friendship and collaboration this wasn't just a real relationship but there were tensions there were tensions that existed between the western um british dig team and the local populations uh but those were happening probably at a sort of higher level um involving these issues like land disputes but I do think though I think the general the, the clinic would have been viewed as being a, a, a positive thing. It looks like we have um, one more question um, you spoke a bit about the the order of St. John in, in Jerusalem and uh, you mentioned that Olga received some of her training specifically for eye disease um, do you know where she sort of picked up other skills for, you know, for example, for like women's health or, or midwifery? Um, was it all through, did you take multiple courses through um, the Order of St. John or were that like some of the skills she had from earlier in life? So I think I'm assuming that um, the eye hospital training was, was purely on eye diseases um, and any other kind of medical experience would have been gained sort of, um, through reading and through consulting doctors when she could. Uh, uh, and anyone, I, I think that she, she may have learned quite a bit on the go. And I think just having that experience could have led to her having knowledge, but as I said, she, she, I don't think she had formal training. It's possible she could have had other training back in the UK when she was visiting. So for the rest of the time of the year, it's possible. And this is not recorded in the letters because she was writing home to her mother. So all the letters are pretty much from the time of the dig. So we're just missing chunks of time. So uh, we don't, we just simply don't know at the moment. Thank you very much. This was fascinating. Thank you. So I think that <clears throat> brings us to a, a close um, for this uh, presentation today. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Jack Green uh, on behalf of uh, all of our co-sponsors uh, and also the internet audience. Um, and uh, we look forward to actually two lectures uh, in this series uh, in April. Um, so uh, stay tuned for further details uh, about the continuation of the series. But again, uh, a, a big thank you uh, to DAC. Uh, fascinating talk today. And really revealing, you know, aspects of uh, earlier archaeology, uh, and as he drew out so nicely, 
that tie into you know some more current trends uh, in terms of, of outreach um, to local groups and benefits to local groups. Um, something that clearly was uh, taking place um, despite colonial imprint, um, but was not written about. And so uh, diving into these archives um, just furthers uh, our understandings uh, of those kinds of interactions. And so a uh, big shout out to him, check out his book, uh, and just big round of thanks to um, all of our co-sponsors and to our presenter today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Really appreciate it.